FIR filters have been growing in popularity over the past decade steadily. They're becoming more and more ubiquitous, baked into loudspeaker processing, into the amps, uh, some in DSPs. So you need to be fluent with them and what they're actually accomplishing. You don't have to know all the underlying math, but I hopefully wanted today share with you what's the difference between FIR filters and their cousin IIR filters, the one that we are used to using. My name is Michael Curtis. I love bringing clarity to folks in audio so they can level up their own skills and land more gigs. So if you're wanting to understand the physics of sound a little bit better so that you can make your system sound its best, I think you'd also love my audio math survival spreadsheet. I've got that here and the very first row, it has frequency. You can put in a frequency, let's call it 100 Hertz, and it'll give you its period, wavelength, and a couple other factors about it. So you can kind of get used to this inextricable link between time and frequency. And you can go backwards. I could put in 10 milliseconds and that's gonna give me 100 hertz. So you really need to have a firm grasp of this if you're gonna do meaningful sound system design and tuning work. And so this is available for you at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. Download it, put it to work, understand this more, I think you'll enjoy it. So let's jump into all you need to know about FIR filters without a math degree. Let's get our definitions straight here. What are FIR filters? So that acronym stands for Finite Impulse Response Filter, which begs the question, is there a inverse of it? Is there infinite impulse response filters? And the, and the answer is yes. If you've used an analog EQ, that is an IIR filter. If you've used a digital EQ in a DAW like Reaper or Logic, with the, if you're not using a linear phase one, which we'll talk about, that is an IIR filter. What that means is using recursion or a little bit of feedback to bring back the signal into itself to get the desired frequency response. But that means since time and frequency are related, which we can get more to in a later video, we can't adjust one without changing the other. So if I have a stu super steep filter rolling off some frequencies, that's going to cost me in adjusting the phase response or how the, the timing of the signal plays out over a specific amount of time. So finite impulse response filters or FIRs, or just that, they are finite, meaning they're defined by a certain amount of digital time called samples or taps in the language. So that means they are innately digital, it's impossible to create an FIR in the analog domain. So it's defined by the number of taps and we can roll our own FIR if we want to, or manufacturers make them to accomplish specific things. So like I said earlier, IIR filters, if I change frequency, it's gonna change magnitude. You can make that happen with FIR as well, but the really cool thing is you can unlink those two. So you can actually change the phase response and the magnitude response of let's say of a loudspeaker independently, which opens up a really cool world of options. Let's take a look at the timing and frequency relationship with filters and how they're different between FIR and IIR. The Fuchsia Trace I've got loaded up here is an EQ that has a low pass filter at 1K. And this is a normal run of the mill digital EQ or what would be an analog EQ in, in, in the physical space that's rolling off at 1K. And we can see that response here and we can see the corresponding phase shift that happens with a normal low pass filter. So nothing new or crazy here. But if I go to this green trace, we can now see that we have this exact same drop off in frequency response, but now the phase trace is ruler flat. It is untouched. And that is the power of an FIR filter. Here's the thing though, we cannot have our cake and eat it too. You may think like, oh wow, I can make any speaker I touch ruler flat, but here's the trade-off. There has to be a total amount of delay applied to the whole signal in order to make the phase phase response stay flat. So that's why you actually, in many FAR filters, don't have anything happening in the first couple taps or samples. It's waiting, then applying its processing in a certain way so that it can keep the phase response the same. I'm not gonna get into all the nitty gritty technical details today, but just know that we can't 
get all the way down to low frequencies a super flat response if we wanted to maybe correct a loudspeaker because low frequencies have very long wavelengths, which means they have take a long time to complete a cycle, so we can't do that. So most manufacturers have settled for getting stuff maybe better in their speakers down to about 300 hertz is a pretty common consensus. Some go a little bit lower, but that would net you three to four milliseconds of total delay, which is doable in live sound. Uh, but if you want to affect 30 hertz, however, that's like, you know, like more than 30 milliseconds of delay, which is undoable, especially if you're trying to get something done with a monitor or mains where the performance can hear them. So that's not going to work. So that's the catch. So the good thing is, is that manufacturers are often taking care of this for us. So that's the first reason why they're useful for us is that a manufacturer can roll their own custom FIR for a speaker that they're making. So here is an RCF HDL6A. This was captured in the field by a colleague on Tracebook and I'm importing his trace. And so the impulse response where the delay tracker latched on wasn't exactly where it needed to be. So we're seeing a slight rise, but I can see from other shows I've captured this rig. Again, the data isn't as clear because of floor bounces, but I use one of these here. And we can see here that even though we have some wraparounds because of floor bounce, we can see that the phase would have made remain pretty darn flat all the way up. So this is cool. They, they have an, their own FIR filter built into the speaker so that the phase remains flat from basically 125 hertz and up, which is pretty unreal. That's un, unheard of in a, in a speaker uh, before the implementation of FIR filters. So what what is the benefit of that? That means every frequency above 125 is arriving at the same time. So there's no smearing of the transient and you can trust it's going to line up with other speakers that have the same phase response. So pretty cool. So that's loaded up in the speaker as something you don't have to adjust as a user. And you can trust that the manufacturer has hopefully done that right for you out the gate. These can also be loaded into a system processor or the amps that power speakers that also have DSP in them. So those are the three spots to look for them at. And there are also speakers out in the wild that have user adjustable ones, meaning you just select a different preset. So here's a QSC K10 on its default setting, captured really well, very high coherence, and we can see its phase trace here. And then we can look at a QSC K10.2 with a different setting. So on the back of the speaker is a knob that you can rotate and you can select different presets. So we can see here, that the default preset keeps it pretty darn flat with a little bit of a low before 500, a little bit of a rise in the low end. And then here on the head mic preset, they know that you don't need a bunch of beef or meat in a head mic and they go ahead and cut that out of a speaker just in case you're running a head mic directly into the speaker. So that's pretty cool versus a stage monitor. So same thing, but it's really close to the default setting, but they are rolling off some of the extra low end that you might not need on stage because you're already getting the half space loading from it sitting on the deck. So here's my, my caveat and conclusion here is that anytime you're using a speaker within a system that has FIRs built into a processor, into the speaker, always make sure you're on the right preset for the specific application that you're putting that speaker in. Because let's say there's a L Acoustics Cara. They have, if you're flying it in the main array, it has a certain preset, or if you're using it as a front fill, it has a different one. On the one where it's flown in the main array, it has a pretty big high frequency tilt on the front fill setting, it stays pretty daggum flat. So if you accidentally left the amp on its where you're flying it with the man array, people are gonna get their heads sawed off by 4K in the front row if you used it as a front fill. All right, to, in to conclude, IIR filters use recursive processing to do some feedback and make the desired magnitude response happen, but it's at the cost of a corresponding phase shift. These are linked because time and frequency are linked. FIR filters 
use special digital processing with coefficients and taps and, and crazy stuff that's beyond my pay grade to be able to adjust frequency and phase independently of each other within specific bounds. The benefits is that we can make sure our loudspeakers are behaving well from a phase response perspective with other loudspeakers within a certain line or even crossing or, uh, over different brands. We can make sure that the transients coming through our speaker are clear and sharper because they're all lined up because we can correct phase response and we can make sure even crossovers within individual cabinets line up. Let's say we have a line array that has like dual 15, some compression drivers and some HF drivers. Uh, those are all of varying size need to cross over. So an FIR can make sure those all marry well with elements that are close together. So they feel a little bit scary. I hope this brought a little bit of clarity to you. Make sure you go to the link below, get my audio mass survival spreadsheet, and I will catch you next week. Thanks.